today on Beyond Six Seconds. I think part of what learning to think innovatively does is it helps you better anticipate the direction that the world is going and what the consumer might want and sort of start to be able to see those things before other people are seeing them. Welcome to Beyond Six Seconds, the podcast that goes beyond the six second first impression to share the extraordinary stories and achievements of everyday people. I'm your host, Carolyn Keel. On today's episode, I'm speaking with Bob Sager, the founder of Spearpoint Solutions, LLC. Bob's professional background includes experience in financial planning and residential real estate. He's a consultant and trainer on how to think innovatively and apply that to practical solutions in business and life. Among other accomplishments, Bob is the inventor of the innovative and creative ideas game called What's the Big Idea? Creator of the inspirational poster, Impossible is an Opinion author of the personal achievement book, Discovering Your Greatness, A Higher Level Thinking and Action Guide, and the forthcoming book, 101 Freaking Brilliant Business Ideas and 10 Ways You Can Create Your Own. Bob, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Carolyn. It's really my pleasure to be with you. Wonderful. Happy to have you here. You've been self-employed for the majority of your working life. So tell me a little bit about the types of roles you had earlier in your career and how those experiences inspired you to create your current business, Spearpoint Solutions. Oh, my gosh. That's a long and winding road. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's a and, big question. And, and if you would have told me, you know, at the beginning of my professional career, this is the path you're going to take to get where you are now, I would have said, Hmm, I'm not sure I want to do that. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the first thing I'd like to tell you is sometimes I think people end up in entrepreneurship or selling, which is sort of an interchangeable terminology, almost by accident. Because I'm not sure a lot of people set out to be entrepreneurs. Uh, while I do believe people have that entrepreneurial spirit, I think it's oftentimes circumstances and experiences that lead them to take that journey. And for me, early in life, I never had an interest or a clue that I would want to be in selling at all mm. or entrepreneurship. Not that I didn't want to kind of be in charge of my own life. I think I've always kind of wanted that. Mm -hmm. But I just never really early on pictured myself as somebody who could sell. And I think part of the reason for that is I had a misperception on what selling is. Mm. And I think a lot of people do. I think a lot of people have this impression that selling is convincing somebody that they need or want something that they don't. Yeah. yeah it's like the used car salesman stereotype. Well, and, and that's an interesting analogy because my first job in sales was as a car salesman, mm. although not used cars. Right. They were new cars. Mm -hmm. And that was almost an accident how I ended up doing that. Uh, I've always been a little bit of a free spirit. And I had a job right out of college that was the worst job I've ever had, ever. You know, a mm -hmm. friend and colleague, Kristen Sherry, uses the term Sunday dread. Oh, yeah. And oh my goodness, that was me. Uh, I had to be at work at 8.30 on Monday morning, and by about 2 in the afternoon on Sunday, I started getting a knot in the pit of my stomach. It was that kind of a job. Yeah. And I quit that one without having another one to go to, mm -hmm. which is, in retrospect, maybe not the smartest thing to do. Mm -hmm. But I'm a little bit of a rebel at heart. And this is back in the days where MTV actually used to play music videos. And I figured out that there is a limit to how many music videos you can watch and still be interested. <laughs> <laughs> I remember those days. <laughs> and so after going through uh, quite a bit of savings and being pretty bored watching MTV, not that I wasn't looking for another job, I was, but I really started getting a lot more serious. And uh, this is back before the era of the internet when the only way to really seek jobs was either through somebody you knew or look in the Sunday newspaper. Yep. And in the Sunday newspaper, an Oldsmobile dealership had a big display ad for a new Oldsmobile salesperson. Mm. And never in my life, as I had alluded to before, did I, had I ever thought about being in selling and especially not car sales. Right. But I needed a job. And I said, I wonder if there's any money to be made there. 
So after going through three different interviews and learning that the average Oldsmobile salesperson was like 56 years old yep. and I was 24, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> but they said, you know, you seem like a sharp, ambitious young guy. We're going to give you a chance. Mm-hmm. And what I discovered was I started making three or four times as much money as I was used to making. And I discovered that the car business, at least at that time, didn't really fit my core Mm -hmm. because it it really wasn't very straightforward. Now, I tried to always be straightforward, but there are certain things you couldn't control. And I said, I really don't especially like the car business, but I think I could get used to making this kind of money. I had always been ambitious, but that it sort of took it to another level. And that was my first adventure in how I sort of got down this path. Wow. So you had mentioned you never saw yourself as a salesperson or being particularly skilled at sales beforehand. What was it about that job that made you very successful? Did you have any special uh, techniques that you picked up? Well, of course, they had training Mm -hmm. and it was sort of old school sales training. I remember they had me for a couple of days watch videotapes by a sales trainer, a car sales trainer named Jackie Cooper. And, you know, I learned a little bit from that. But listen, primarily the reason I did well there is I worked hard. I remember they used to call me king of the late night Mm. because our dealership closed at 9 p.m. And after about 8.30, the less ambitious people, they were nowhere to be found. So if somebody came on the car lot at 8.45, I was pretty much the only person that was talking to them. Mm. And that, Carolyn... I just treated people the way I'd want to be treated. And I felt like I owed that to them. I felt like, you know what? If I were coming in to buy a car, this is how I would want somebody to deal with me. And that's how I did it. And that plus working hard and learning a little bit about selling then, but frankly, it's kind of stuff that I needed to unlearn over the years. Mm -hmm. It really wasn't very good. But hard work and treating people well, that is what I attribute my success there to. Yeah, I could definitely see how those skills would serve you well as an entrepreneur having your own business. Whether or not you think you're in sales or whether or not you want to be in sales, like you are in sales when you have your own business. And yeah, I see how that translates well. Well, look, if you can't sell, you're going to fail at business Mm. because people don't think of themselves as selling. And yet in everyday situations, I don't care if you're quote unquote in sales or not, you're selling something all the time or somebody selling something to you. I mean, that's just the way it is. To me, quality sales, it's about influence to a degree, but it really is, if you're successful as an entrepreneur or as a salesperson, you are a problem solver as opposed to a product pusher. Mm. You're more, in some ways, like a consultant where you really need to build that relationship with the person that you're selling to and learn what they need and how you can help them. And you have to care about it. Yeah. Well, I think if you don't understand people, you don't understand business. Yep, that's a really good point. Well, it's great that you learned that lesson early on in your career. It sounds like it served you well throughout your entrepreneurial journey. And now, you know, with Spearpoint Solutions, you've become really focused on helping companies and individuals with innovation and helping them kind of understand what risks they can take, how to come up with new ideas, and I imagine that's a pretty big part of being an entrepreneur as well. And I'm sure something you have quite a bit of experience with throughout your entire career. Well, one thing for sure, the world is constantly moving forward. And today's world, it's a dramatically faster pace. Mm -hmm. And so if you are not prepared to be thinking about ways to constantly improve what you're doing, improve the value that you're offering to the world, and that's true whether it's a product or a service, doesn't really matter. That mindset needs to pervade what you're doing. It kind of reminds me of the old joke that, you know, when should you tell your spouse you love them? And that's before somebody else does. Yeah. <laughs> and so if you, <laughs> yep. so look, you've got to be constantly thinking about if you're going to be successful but more than average and not be stressed all the time, you've got to be thinking about, in what ways can I add more value to my customers? And, you know, and it's the right thing to do, but it pays dividends because when you do things in that manner, it makes you appear in the customer's mind to be different. And when you're different, 
you're not viewed as a commodity because when you are viewed as a commodity, you're just the same as everybody else. The only basis you have for competing is price. Right. And so that's a downward death spiral. So if you don't want to compete on price and, and have constantly reducing margins, you better be doing things that offer unexpected value to the customer. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And you really can't do that unless you're keeping a really innovative mindset, looking out and understanding what your customers need, both what they're asking for and what they may not know that they want yet. Yeah, and, and I think part of what learning to think innovatively does is it helps you better anticipate the direction that the world is going and what the consumer might want and sort of start to be able to see those things before other people are seeing them. And, you know, it's like Wayne Gretzky, famous hockey player. We talked about how he skated to where the puck was going to be, yes, where it was. And so I think learning to think innovatively, it helps you do that better. And it leaves your competitors wondering, how do they do that? Yeah. And that's a big part of your current business. And as I mentioned in your bio, you've actually invented a game that helps stimulate people's creative thinking and innovation. Can you tell me a little bit more about where the idea for the game came from and and what that's like? Absolutely. In fact, that was a seminal moment for me. I remember I had left the financial services industry after 17 years, primarily to teach people about how to achieve a higher level of success through personal development. And I had done a lot with that over the 17-year career that I had there. And I had discovered a lot of things that had helped me personally. And that's why I ended up putting them you know, in the book, Discovering Your Greatness. And we had developed a whole proprietary personal achievement program, we called it. And two years into that new business, we were doing okay. But okay was not what I had in mind. And I said, you know, we need to do things in a better way. And so I find this to be kind of comical now, Carolyn, but Mm -hmm. at that time, I did not consider myself to be really all that creative. And this is less than a decade ago. Mm. But I said, you know, maybe there are some books on creativity and maybe I can learn something about coming up with better ideas. And so I bought a book, which I highly recommend, by the way, it's called Thinker Toys. Oh. It's written by a gentleman named Michael Machalko, and it's a compilation of probably, there's probably 12 dozen different creative thinking methods in there. And I, I bought that. And for me, not really considering myself at that time to be creative and not really having any experience working with that kind of material, some of those look a little bit complicated at first. But I discovered a technique in there called combinatory play which sounds complicated, but it's not. Mm -hmm. And I, by the way, I learned later that it was both Einstein and Da Vinci, their favorite creative thinking method. So that tells you a guy who was mostly a scientist, but an imaginative one, and a guy who was sort of a Renaissance person, you know, part scientist, part artist in Da Vinci. If it worked for both of them, it's probably pretty good. And so I discovered that technique. And look, all combinatory play is, is combining two different things together and seeing what third, fourth, fifth possibilities occur to you. And they can be seemingly disparate things. Like I was on a conference call earlier today and I used the example of you know, people think in pictures, not in words. Mm-hmm. And so if I say the word horse, a picture of a horse pops up into your mind. Right. If I say the word table, a you know, picture of a table, some sort of table pops up in your mind. But if I start combining those two things together, If I say horse table or table horse, then your imagination is immediately activated and starts working on what could that be. Mm. And so when I discovered that technique in that book, I was astounded at just the little exercise that's in the book at one, the quantity and two, the quality of the ideas that I started generating. In fact, it almost seemed like magic to me, Carolyn. I began looking around going, where in the world are these ideas coming from? Because Mm -hmm. I know they're not possibly coming from me. (laughs) (laughs) It was like I was channeling some sort of supernatural force or something. But what it was is just I was tapping into a part of myself that most people, including me, haven't used since they were about five years old. Mm -hmm. And the more I utilize this technique, 
the more impressed I was with it and the more I realized what power it had with a caveat. Mm. And the caveat is, you know, a lot of people have heard the phrase that knowledge is power. Well, that that's not really true. Knowledge is only power to the degree that it's applied. Mm. And so this thinking method is only powerful to the degree that it's applied. So I began thinking we could probably use this in our business of helping people achieve more if there was a way to consistently get them to use it. And I knew that it had to have, because I'm a student of human beings, I knew it had to have three elements. It had to have some structure because people are used to having a framework to operate within. It had to feel like fun. You couldn't feel like work because human beings being what they are, if it feels like work, they want to do less of it. Right. Feels like fun, they want to do more of it. Mm -hmm. And three, I felt like it had to embrace competitiveness in some way. And so that thought, thinking about that for, I probably pondered on that for four or five weeks. And I'm driving along in a car one day, not even really even thinking about it. And just like a bolt out of the blue, it popped up into my mind. It had to be a game. In fact, not only did that pop up into my mind, but the structure of how it should work popped up into my mind. And it was just, I, I couldn't wait to get inside to write everything down that was bubbling up from my subconscious. It was a very profound experience. Awesome. And the current format that you have for it, I think it's a board game, isn't it? Or it's a very hands-on tactile game that you've developed. Well, it's two things. It's a tabletop game mm -hmm. and it is also a mobile app oh. that is available for Android currently, iOS soon. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. How do you play the game? And we utilize this in a lot of our training. And we use a gaming format in almost all of the training that we do mm -hmm. for a couple of reasons. It's much more fun to do it that way. And what I have found is that things that are learned in an environment where people are emotionally involved, mm -hmm. and anytime people are laughing and having fun and competing, they're emotionally involved, it sticks with them better. Sure. And so that kind of training is much more effective than just a lecture with dozens of PowerPoint slides. Definitely. So the way the game works is there are three teams. There's the inventor team, the competitor team, and the customer team. Mm -hmm. And the inventor and the competitor team, they get a set of 10 words, mostly nouns. Occasionally, there's a modifier in there. Mm -hmm. And they're combining any two of those words like I had alluded to horse and table before, right? Mm -hmm. They're combining any two of those words and they're coming up with an idea for a new product, a new service, or a new business, or an improvement on what something that might already exist in the marketplace. And they get three minutes to do that. And at the end of three minutes, each team, the inventor and competitor team, they take one minute to present to the customer team what it is, how it works, and what the benefits are. Mm. And then the customer team decides, do I like the inventor's team idea better or do I like the competitor team idea better? And then uh, there's a scoring system and play moves around the board so that everybody plays each one of those roles as the game goes along. And two things happen every time people are playing this game. One people laugh their heads off mm -hmm. because new ideas are a little off center from what you're used to hearing. Right. Mm -hmm. And so people giggle. Uh, but the other thing that you hear all the time is that is a really good idea. Mm. And Carolyn, people shock themselves at the ideas they come up with. They have that same experience I had where they're, they're looking around going, that couldn't possibly be me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's wow. incredible. That's awesome. And it sounds like that environment, because it is a game, you know, you're having the customer team rate which idea they like better, but you're also removing that that judgment that tends to kill ideas during the ideation process, where it's like, oh, that'll never work, or that's kind of dumb, or that's a little crazy. You're actually opening people's mind to be receptive enough so that the idea can live and breathe a little bit and have a chance. So that's pretty cool. It's so cool. And I had a client tell me once, he said, you know what the greatest thing about this game and doing this process is, Bob? I said, 
No, what? His name is David. Mm -hmm. I said, what, David? He said, when you win, you win. And when you lose, you still win. Yeah. Right? Because you're still coming up with ideas. And and we always digitally record everything that people come up with during these sessions Mm -hmm. and give them a copy of it so that they can listen back through it. Because the ideas that are relevant to you in your business, your subconscious grabs onto those. Mm -hmm. And when you listen back through that audio, oftentimes people will say, you know what? It's good the way it is, but if we added this to it or made this little modification or took this away, it would be even better. So it's an incredibly powerful process. That's awesome. And I've noticed that when I've been in ideation sessions or when I'm just trying to think of new ideas, sometimes I have to think of the crazy or the quote unquote bad ideas that won't fly, but you have to get those out in the open because they trigger the other ideas that will work. So it's like, you know, as you said, you started to see the world in new eyes and we're wondering where all these ideas were coming from. It's, it's almost like starting up a motor. Sometimes you have to start it up. It's a little rough and you get everything out, but once it runs, You just start making those connections more naturally and it will lead you to better and better ideas. That's interesting that you say that because one of the methods that we use is come up with 10 bad ideas. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, you know, we preface that by saying, why is it that professional photographers take such good photographs, Mm -hmm. right? And the reason they get such great shots is that they take so many Right. Mm -hmm. And when you take that many pictures, you're bound to get some good ones. Guess what? You'll get a whole lot of bad ones too, but that's okay. People are so used to being judged negatively and there's a big fear of that. And so once you get them over that hurdle by purposefully coming up with 10 bad ideas, sometimes uh, buried within those 10 bad ideas, there's actually a pearl. Oh, absolutely. And that brings up another really critical point of innovating, whether you're an entrepreneur or you're working at a large corporation or whatever you're doing, is that a big part of it is taking risks and experiencing failure. And uh, as we were preparing for the podcast, you uh, very generously offered to share a couple stories about uh, some of your failures that you've experienced in entrepreneurship and what you've learned from them and how they've contributed to your ideas of innovation and development in your business. So could you share a story or two about failures that you've experienced and what you learned from them? Well, we'd need about a 19 hour podcast to lay out (laughs) all my failures. Look, I look at failure differently than I used to. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a tendency to, I think this is based in our school system, by the way, failure is so critiqued, so overwhelmingly emotional that people are so afraid of failing and they're so afraid of being judged negatively that we have a tendency to not take any sort of risk because there might be failure. Mm. I can tell you, I started learning really about failure in the real estate business. Mm. In the real estate business, one of the big things that you're always told is there's a term, it's called listers last. That if you get listings, you'll last in the business. And if you don't, you're probably going to be, it's either going to be a hobby or it's going to be a temporary uh, gig for you because you're not going to make enough money or have enough fun. Uh So (laughs) in order to get listings, there's a lot of different things that they suggest that you do. And (laughs) I remember uh, one of the things that they was suggested to me was to have uh, what they called a listing farm. And a listing farm was you picked out a neighborhood of homes that you were comfortable with Mm -hmm. and you went and just spent, you know, an an hour a day knocking on doors, talking to people. Well, I don't know if that might have worked. I I was in real estate business in the mid to late 80s. And I don't know if that technique worked prior to that. But I found, you know, there were two income households were really prevalent then. Mm -hmm. And I found I would spend a lot of time knocking on doors where either people weren't home or they weren't answering. Right. And so, you know, I'm out there dressed in a suit Mm. and it's 90 degrees and I'm sweating. And, you know, I've spent all this money on collateral material that I'm I'm handing to people, but mostly just leaving stuck in, in their door. Right. And that was a frustrating experience, you know, but I learned something from it. I learned that that doesn't work. 
Mm. And at least it didn't work for me. Mm -hmm. And I had, boy, tons of failures in in, uh, financial services too. (laughs) One of the things that, that I learned was I'm a pretty confident person, but sometimes you can be a little overconfident. And I remember, uh, I thought I knew something about financial services and how investment products work. And this is early in my career. And I met with a client who knew more than me. Mm. And that was very embarrassing. (laughs) And (laughs) I'm trying to educate him, you know, by showing him the rule of 72 and talking about how money compounds at different rates of return. And he started talking to me about, uh, a drip program and he started talking about you know the ramifications of taxation and it just all kinds of different things i had no clue about because i was i was so green yeah. but all those experiences lead into growth mm-hmm. because you don't like the way that feels and so i don't want that to happen again and when you have that feeling you think what am i going to do about this i can either shrink back and not try to do anything or I can redouble my efforts to learn and grow and get better. And for me, my desire to succeed was so strong. You know, it reminds me of a phrase I heard that when the what and the why are strong enough, you'll figure out the how. Yeah. And so that was it for me. And But now I look back, I have completely changed my view of failure. There is no such thing as failure. There are either successes or learning experiences. And I've gotten mature enough, and this is, I've been this way for several years now, to look at something that doesn't work out quite the way I want it to and ask, what is the lesson to be learned? Yeah. No, that's great. I totally see that failure is an important part of innovation. Of course, you have to be open to failure and taking risks in order to get the big idea. Are there different types of failure, like any particular failures you really should avoid? Or really, is any failure just an opportunity to learn? I think it certainly can be if you're open to it. And the thing that I would say is that if you're going to fail, and you are, Mm -hmm. you need to do that fast and learn the lessons and glean from that what you can. And look, if you're truly focused on serving the customer well, then you're really going to be around on their side of the fence, asking, what is it that they need or want? Now, when you're doing that and you take that mindset, the failure is probably going to come, if it does, in your method of delivering. Mm. And so that's where the biggest lesson probably is to be learned, assuming that first mindset. Now, a lot of people don't have that first mindset. They have a product or service that they're convinced is great. And they just go out there and see if they can force it on the marketplace. Mm. But you talk about a recipe for failure, that's a recipe for failure. If you're not perceptive enough and care enough about really serving the customer in something that they want or need, then you can crash and burn. And I think a lot of business people don't think that way enough. Yeah, You know, every company, if you ask them, would definitely say that customer focus is part of their core values. I think, you know, depending on the organization, the execution of that varies. So if you are truly, you know, (laughs) it's all up to interpretation. It gets a lot of lip service, Carolyn. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. And I think that's sometimes harder than it sounds because you can't just go out and listen to what your customers are saying they want and you can't go out and order take. Essentially, you have to really think beyond that. So I guess what advice would you have for entrepreneurs who are kind of really struggling to find that right product or service idea that will help grow their business? I'm sure customer focus is one of them, but what kind of advice would you give them? Well, I think that ought to go without saying customer focus, but, you know, since we've kind of already beat that horse, Mm -hmm. we won't go back there. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing that I would say is, what do you really care about? What problems do you see In fact, here's a good innovative thinking technique for your listeners. Mm -hmm. And this can lead to an entrepreneurial venture. What is it in your life, some aspect of your life, your personal life, your work life, your kids' lives, in your hobbies, what is it there that just doesn't quite work right? And assuming nothing is impossible, 
in a perfect world, how would it work? And oftentimes, you know, if you have a problem and you're unsatisfied with something, chances are a lot of other people are too. And so if you can be that person that comes up with the answers to that, then you can lead the field. And so that's a question that, that I ask often, what isn't quite working right in this area? And so that really is how to skate to where the puck is going to be, is to be that person who is thinking in that way, as opposed to just trying to make improvements on something at the margins. Yeah, that absolutely makes a lot of sense. And as you were talking through that, I just thought of another question about something that I think a lot of entrepreneurs have to deal with. One way to spark innovation is to, you know, if, at least if you're in a team environment, work with people who have different backgrounds and skills and experiences and points of view. But I know a lot of times, particularly if you're on your own as an entrepreneur, you may not have as many people to bounce ideas off of. Cause, you know, you don't have an organization where everybody's just like sitting there and, and working closely together. So in your experiences, have you had people in your business or in your life who you either mentor or provide feedback or who you can bounce ideas off of? And does that help you be more innovative? Well, it does. And one of the greatest things that you can do is be part of a mastermind group. And I think this is especially true for people who are uh, solopreneurs or small business owners, because in their world, there aren't that many of those people that are focused on success and maybe are dealing with some of the same sorts of issues that they are both in business and sort of the emotional roller coaster that you can go through as a business owner. So as part of a mastermind group, it's just an amazing dynamic when you can get like-minded people together and you can talk about these things and just sometimes we found in the mastermind groups that I've been part of is that you can, by talking with other people about these issues, oftentimes just talking through that, sometimes the, the solutions occur to you without even getting their input. Mm -hmm. uh, it's good to get their input and you will get so just some amazing ideas, but there's I don't know even how to explain it, Carolyn. There's just some magical power that when two or three or more people get together that are open to collaboration, that are willing to help one another, that have the right attitude, and especially you know if they're on a sort of a peer level, there's just a, a magical mental energy that's there that doesn't exist when you're just on your own. Yeah, absolutely. I've heard great things about masterminds. I wasn't as familiar with them, but it does seem like a great resource. Well, and we just, <laughs> this is interesting. That's, I find that question to be so interesting because we just literally kicked off a mastermind group that I'm coordinating and facilitating. So it's an incredible thing. And, and we found it to be incredibly powerful, both in terms of sharing experience and obviously, you know, success stories. Uh, it's good to get that. But then one of the components that we built into ours is that innovative thinking and bringing people together and coming up with ideas and strategies for one another. And it's really pretty powerful. That's awesome. And are those the, uh, I know you do regular calls with small groups of people. Is that the mastermind group you're referring to? Well, it's actually, uh, it's an offshoot of that. Oh. Well, what you're referring to is more of a business networking called Meaningful Connections. Oh. And our mastermind group is called Meaningful Connections Mastermind. Mm. And it's anybody can participate in Meaningful Connections. It's no, available at no cost and there are no uh, screening parameters or anything like that. Uh, Meaningful Connections Mastermind is, is a higher level thing and it's not free and there's a definite time commitment. And so, you know, it's people that are ready to take their success to a really a much higher level and have a lot more fun with business. Wow, that's fantastic. So you really offer a lot of different products and services to help support entrepreneurs as well as help companies become more innovative and help people change their thinking about innovation and basically thinking differently and changing their mindset about how to evolve and create new business. Well, thank you. You know, my mantra 
is now, has been for several years. It's a simple question. In what ways can I add more value to more people? And when you have that as your mindset, things occur to you and opportunities present themselves to you that are sometimes unexpected. And you obviously, you have to evaluate. A powerful concept is learning to say no, which is very tough for, for people, especially people like me who want the help. Mm-hmm. But it's um, one bit of advice that I would have for entrepreneurs or frankly for anybody is learn to be able to say no to the dozens of good and possibly really good things in order to say yes to the three or four or five great things. Yeah, because every no that you're saying, you're in some ways you're actually saying yes to something else because you only have so much time. Right. So how can people get in touch with you to learn more about all of the different services you provide? You know, the the best forum to find me in or on is LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. I think LinkedIn is possibly one of the greatest inventions of business ever. The way I view LinkedIn, it's like a massive worldwide online business networking forum. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's just, uh, it's great. People can look me up there. I may not be the only Bob Sager on there, but I, I might be. So that's easily the best place to find me. That sounds great. And I'll put a link to your profile in the show notes of this podcast so people can find it there too. Perfect. As we close out, is there anything else you'd like our listeners to know or anything else that they can help or support you with? Yeah, this is interesting. I don't know when people will be hearing this and podcasts, you know, kind of live forever. So Mm -hmm. this may not still be relevant when you're hearing this, but this is the you know, mid-September when we're recording this of 2018. Mm-hmm. And so I get inspired notions periodically, Carolyn. They just come to me. I don't know where from, but somewhere bigger than me. And to celebrate the forthcoming launch of the uh, 101 Freaking Brilliant Business Ideas book, I got the inspired notion that I was supposed to, at no charge, come up with a business strategy or fundraising strategy for businesses and nonprofits, 101 of them. And so I've already done several. We have some several in the queue, but there are still some, at least as we're recording this, some open spaces in the 101. So reach out to me. I'll let you know if any part of the 101 are still available and we'll come up with something that will be unique and powerful. Wow, that's fantastic. What a great opportunity for people. That's awesome. Well, thank you again, Bob, for being a guest on my show today. And I wish you continued success with helping people be more innovative in business and in life. Thank you, Carolyn. I've enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to Beyond Six Seconds. Please help us spread the word about this podcast. Share it with a friend. Give us a shout out on your social media or write a review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player. You can find all of our episodes on our website, www.beyond.com. Dot beyond six seconds.com. Until next time.